First Samuel chapter number nine, we are in a brand new series. We started last Sunday called Rise and Fall, Rise and Fall. And we're talking together about the potential that you could rise to great heights, rise to great levels, rise to what God has called you to do, or you could fall like the Clippers. <laughs> you could fall like the Cowboys. You could fall. But you could, it's called rise and fall. Rise and fall. And I want to just talk for the next few weeks about the potential that you could become who God has called you to become. You could rise to great levels all through the power of humility. All through the ability to stay humble in your own eyes. But remember, the Bible teaches us God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So if you're prideful, if you deal with pride, God is, he is forced to humble you. But if you are humble, God, through his grace, he will exalt you rather than you trying to exalt yourself. Somebody say amen. Amen. So that's our goal. That's our desire. We're trying to humble ourselves. In other words, if we humble ourselves, God won't have to humble us. So we want to humble ourselves in a humble way so that God, by his power, by his nature, he can raise us up. Amen. And so we're talking together out of 1st and 2nd Samuel. We're studying these two books, 1st and 2nd Samuel. And last week, if you missed episode number one or installment one, we studied the life of Samuel. We are talking out of Samuel. And Samuel, if you missed last week, he was a hero. He was a legend. He did so well. He finished so well. He was the man. But at the end of his life, the, the church, Israel, they said to Samuel, we don't want you anymore. You're not good enough. We want, because Samuel was a judge, we don't want judges anymore. We want a king. And so Samuel goes to God and says, God, what do I do? I've been uh, leading. I've been, been trying my best. What do you want me to do? And so God says to Samuel, don't worry. They have not rejected you, Sam. They have rejected me. Give them a king. And so God uses Samuel to orchestrate the transition from judges to kings in the Old Testament. They go from having judges as their leader to a monarchy. Now they have kings. So when they are searching for their first king, you know that God had to do some due diligence. It's kind of like when you have the number one draft pick in the NFL or you have the number one draft pick in the NBA. You want to, you know, bring the athlete to your headquarters, to your team facility, and you do some workouts and you do some interviews to see if they're smart and you look through their social media to see if they're sketchy and, you know, you do your homework. And so, you know, God was doing his research on the, come on, it's the first ever king in the Bible. And so he chooses a man now, out of the 12 tribes, he chooses someone from Benjamin. Benjamin just happens to be the least of all the tribes. So in our context, this is Rancho Cucamonga. You're tracking. And so he chooses a king, the first ever king, first draft pick. He chooses a man from Benjamin named Saul. In fact, watch what God says to Samuel when he makes the draft pick. Watch this. It says in 1 Samuel chapter 9, Now the day before Saul came, the Lord revealed this to Samuel. About this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him ruler over my people Israel. He will deliver them from the hand of the Philistines. I have looked on my people, for their cry has reached me. When Samuel caught sight of Saul, the Lord said, This is is the man I spoke to you about. He will govern my people. So Samuel is kicking it, drinking a diet lemonade from Chick-fil-A, and he's just chilling, and the Lord says, tomorrow at this time, when you have your diet lemonade, you're going to see a man, and when you see him, that's going to be the guy. And so the next day, he got the same order, and he's sitting there having his Chick-fil-A, and he sees the man, and the Lord says, that's the guy. Now think about this. In all of the land of Israel, out of all the candidates, God said, that's the man I choose. Now you'd have to believe and be convinced that if God chose this man, he must be great. And on the exterior, he is. In fact, the physical attributes are crazy. The Bible says of Saul that he's tall, dark, and handsome. So he looks like a king. 
Because, you know, it, remember when Jesus was like, I'm the Messiah. And they're like, you ain't no Messiah. You are short. You don't look like a Messiah. We're not going to fall for it. You, don't, you, you look like you go to tech school, buddy. You look, <laughs> you look like a carpenter. You ain't going to be no, you ain't my Messiah, not my president. You know what I'm saying? That's what they said to Jesus. King Saul looks the part. Saul is tall, and he's dark, and he's handsome, and he looks like he is the man. And from the exterior, he is, but he's got a whole world of issues on the inside, from the outside. In fact, the next king that God chooses is a man named David. And when God chooses David, he says, listen, the man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You can't fool God. So God, even though he saw some issues with Saul, even though Saul has some problems in his life, he still believes, I know Saul's got problems, but as long as he depends on me, as long as he relies on me, as long as he turns to me, we can heal those issues. We can heal that trauma. We can heal those problems and he will fulfill the call of God in his life. I want to preach a message right down the title of today's message. It's called The Pain of Not Dealing With Your Problems. The Pain of Not Dealing With Your Problems. A lot of us, you got problems, you got issues, you got, you got situations, and they're, they're more in your inner world than your outer world. That's okay. Be encouraged. We are all under construction today. We are all a work in progress. I'll never forget one time when I was in high school, my little brother was dating this girl, and we were sitting around as a family watching a, a, a TV, and my little brother's dating this girl. I want to be a big brother, a good big brother. So I said to my brother, I was like, hey, man, you don't, don't date that girl. She, what? No, ew, no. It's like, and I said, that girl's a project. And my dad pressed mute. He said, what'd you say? I was like, you know, dad, like trying to like step up, you know, like, you know, dad, like she got issues. And my dad, I'll never forget, he humbled me real quick this day. He said, um, son, just a heads up. When your mom started dating me, I was a project. And I don't know if you realize this about you, son, but you are a project. <laughs> you know, you get corrected as a kid. You just look down the ground like. See, all of us have issues on the inside. And God chose Saul even though he saw issues. But God chose him because potentially he could still be amazing. Potentially he could still be a leader. See, God has not chosen you because you're great. God chose you because he, you're his. And he has placed on the inside of you such power and such potential of what you could possibly do on the earth for the glory of the living God. Oh, come on, clap together if you're thankful. Come on, in spite of all your issues, anybody thankful that the Lord still called your name? In fact, I'm gonna give you a few things to write down today. Write down number one, I love this. Your potential is your only competition. Your competition in life is not your classmates or your siblings or your coworkers or other people on social media. Your only competition in life is you. And it's not the version that you are today. It's the version that you could potentially become. So you need to understand this about your potential. Potentially, you could be amazing or potentially, you could be a disaster. Potentially, you could change the world or potentially, you could change the world for bad. Potentially, God could use your life or potentially, God will have to heal heal your life. It's all up to what you want to do with your potential. But your only competition in life is your potential. Oh, I love going to Orange Theory Fitness. I'm an Orange Theory Fitness guy. I know it doesn't show up in my body, but I do work out. And so I go to Orange Theory Fitness, and I love going. I put on the little band, and I love, you know, I like to start on the treadmill. I'm a tread guy. I get there early so I can sign up for tread number nine. And I get there, and I love to work out. And I don't work out for my body, clearly. I work out for my mind. <laughs> and so I go to work out, and when I'm there, there's this big screen with all the other people in the class that tell me how good they're doing based upon the gray, the, the blue, the green, the orange, or the red. You want to be in the orange, and if you're in the red, you're out of shape. <laughs> and, so, and so when I'm there, I don't care about what anybody else is doing. I'm only caring about what I'm doing because my only competition in life is me. I just want to encourage you today. Potentially, you could be amazing. Potentially, you could be awful. It's all about your surrender and your submission to God. 
and who you decide to lean on, trust in, follow, serve. If you serve yourself, you will destroy yourself. If you serve your God, you will save your life. Your only competition in life is you. Potential. Look at this word potential. I love it in the Greek. It's dunamis. It means possibility or capability. Depending on context, it could be translated as, watch these words, potency, potential, capacity, ability, possibility, force. And it is the root of the modern English words dynamic and dynamite. God put inside of you dynamite. God put inside of you a dynamic. God put inside of you possibility and capability and future. And I'm telling you, you could potentially, come on, clap a little bit louder. Westside, clap with us. Anybody thankful? Come on, for your God-given potential. It's not the potential based on your own talent and your own gifting. It is a gift from God. Your only competition in life is your potential. Because I just want to encourage you today, potentially you could change the world. Potentially you could have a great family. Potentially you could have a great marriage. Potentially you could develop great kids. Potentially you could be who God's called you to be. Potentially. And I love this idea because we look here and Saul's chosen and the potential is crazy. Watch what Samuel says in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 20. And don't worry about those donkeys. Saul had lost some donkeys and they were lost for three days. And that's how he got hooked up with Samuel. For they have been found. And I'm here to tell you, you and your family are the focus of all Israel's hopes. In other words, he's saying all of our potentials wrapped up in you. Saul replied, but I'm only from the tribe of Benjamin Cucamonga, the smallest tribe in Israel. And my family is the least important of all the families of that tribe. Why are you talking to me like this? He's, he's, he's just like, wait, I'm the number one draft pick? We don't even got good internet where I come from. Wait, he's going to say, what? This is crazy. And, and he's saying, yeah, your, our, our, our potential as a nation rides on you, buddy. Can, can I just encourage you? There's more people counting on you fulfilling your potential than you realize. There's more people looking at you. I don't mean to put pressure on you, but I do want to invite you into the God story of your life. God has a call on your life. And, 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 and so Saul starts off, he's humble and he's dependent and he's leaning into God and he's and he's watching God, and he's trusting in God, and so, and so his start is fantastic. He starts so good. Write down point number two today. I love this. Great starts don't matter. <laughs> you ever start something, like you start off, and you're feeling it, and you start, and you feel like great, and it's like how I feel about every Ikea project. It's like, it's start, <laughs> killing it. And then we open the box. I'm like, I'm done. <laughs> I'll never forget the first time I ran a, a half marathon. One year for Christmas, I went to my mom, and I was like, Mom, this year for Christmas, whatever you ask for, whatever you want me to do, wh whatever you want to do, uh, do together, I'll do it with you. And I was thinking she was going to say, let's go to Cabo, which I was down for. And, but she's like, son, mijo, my mom's Mexican, mijo, let's run a half marathon together. Oh, it's like the worst idea I've ever had. And so... The half marathon in Seattle happens Thanksgiving weekend when it rains. And so on Thanksgiving weekend that year, I ran the half marathon with my mom. Well, we started together and then I, I left her in the dust. And so when, when, when it started, I'll never forget, I did no training. But when it started, the first five, six miles, I was floating in the air like Titanic style. I felt so good. I was like this, I am killing it. And there's 20,000 people, I'm running, I'm feeling great, I'm just killing it. Mile six, I was like, wait a second, this is, I did not plan for this, and it's raining much harder than I thought. Anybody could start a marriage, but it's about how you end a marriage. Anybody could start to serve God, but it's how the rest of your life looks like. It's not about how you start in life, it's about how you end in life. The end of a thing is better than the beginning of a thing. And what I want to tell somebody is stop starting and stopping starting and stopping. No, the Bible says, well done, my good and faithful servant. I'm just going to be faithful to serve him. I'm going to be faithful to worship him. I'm going to be faithful to love him. I'm going to be faithful to, come on, clap and thank God today. It's not about how you start. 
And when Saul starts, he's the man. When Saul starts, he's like, oh, that's, what, that's why he's the number one pick. That's why we chose him. Look at Saul. He's killing it. So Saul starts, and he gets this big win over the Ammonites, and everybody's like, yeah, number one pick. That's what I'm talking about. Saul's the man. God, you're wise. You knew potentially Saul could be great. Yeah, but even though you start great, that doesn't mean you stay great. You ever notice that when you start, everybody's there, but I call it the loneliness of the middle. I'll tell you, when we started nine years ago, we're going to celebrate in two Sundays. I'm going to go nuts. I'm bringing horchata. I'm bringing a piñata. I'm bringing a somethingata. We're going to go nuts. When we started, August 21st, Nine years ago, we started in the club, One Oak. That's what we were trying to do, yeah. We were partying for Jesus. We had a line down Sunset Boulevard. We started, I'm telling you, people flew in, pastors from all over the nation. Our parents flew in, our pastors flew in. We had, but I'll tell you what, how we started was great, but it's, it's the loneliness of the middle when you have to lean into God and say, I know that my parents and my pastors and my friends aren't here, but I know that God is here. And the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Oh, come on, clap today if you've ever seen God. Be faithful in the middle of the mess, in the middle of the mute, in the the middle of your quiet, in the middle of the midnight hour, clap a little bit louder and thank your God. If God has been faithful when you were in the middle, that's why it's not about how you start. It's about how you end your life. And I want to end my life with the people around me that I love. You know what your goal ought to be in life? The people that know you the most respect you the best. They respect you because of who you are. They know you and they love you and they're for you. I don't care how you start today. Maybe you've had a bad start or a good start. It doesn't matter. Be faithful in the middle. And so God chooses Saul, and he goes out of the tribe of Benjamin, out of the least likely candidates, out of the university of get your degree online, we're choosing Saul. And Saul's our guy. And so they choose Saul, and they, they bring him forward. And, and Saul's like, why are you talking to me like this? I'm, I'm a nobody. And God says, no, we, 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 we did our homework on you, son. We, we stalked your account. We, 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 we chose you. You're the first king. Saul's like, man, all right. So he starts and he's, and he's, and he's serving. But the further that he gets into the position, the more it exposes his weaknesses. And I just, I love this about God is that God is not a helicopter parent. That's like, I don't want my kids to face anything hard. God's so good, he'll throw you into difficult situations so you'll learn how to rely on him more than yourself. And so, and so some things start getting exposed in Saul's life. Four things that when I'm going to talk to you about these four things, they're not four things I'm looking at you going, yeah, get it right, buddy. There are more four things I look at my life and be like, oh, Jesus, help me not to be that guy. Help me, God to follow you and to serve you. Here are the four things that happen in Saul's life that maybe one or two are happening in your life today. Here's what gets exposed over time of what Saul is, is dealing with, his problems. It's gonna cause a lot of pain. Here's the first one, write it down. Number one, his downfall started because he was number one, he was insecure. Or as the kids like to say, insecure. <laughs> and he's insecure. In fact, the first time they go to announce him, this is crazy. They go to announce their king. All of Israel has been begging God, give us a king. And so they've been praying, we want a king. And so they go to announce for the first time. And they bring all of Israel together. And they come to announce. And they blow the trumpet. Da -da 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 -da. And they make the announcement. And now, announcing the number one draft pick, first choice, king of Israel, 6'6". Six -six. From North Carolina. Sorry, that's Michael Jordan. But um, they announce him and they go, Saul! And he's nowhere to be found. 
<laughs> the announcer's like, I'm pretty loud. I'm sure you heard that. Let's try it again. And now, announcing, Saul. He's nowhere to be found because he's so insecure. He's so in his head about who he is. Watch this. I love this verse. Look at this. First Samuel chapter 10. So Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel before the Lord, and the tribe of Benjamin was chosen by Lot. Then he brought out each of the families of the tribe of Benjamin before the Lord, and the family of the Matrites was chosen. And finally Saul, son of Kish, was chosen from among them. But when they looked for him, he had disappeared. So they asked the Lord, where is he? Where's our king? And the Lord replied, oh, he's hiding in the baggage claim at LAX. So they found him and brought him out, and he stood head and shoulders above everyone else. And then Samuel said to all the people, this is the man the Lord has chosen as your king. No one in all of Israel is like him. Even though God was saying one thing about Saul, Saul was saying another thing about himself. He's saying, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not talented enough. I don't come from the right family. I don't have enough gifting and anointing. I need you to stop making excuses about what God has called you into. Stop being plagued by insecurity when your father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Come on, clap and thank the Lord together. I might not be perfect, but I know who I belong to. And I, I, I've said this a lot of times at Zoe. Let me say it again. I pray you have a touch of insecurity, like just a smidge, just a little hair, just a little drop of insecurity because insecurity will develop some social awareness that you need. I pray you, but I, I don't want you to be plagued with insecurity. Saul was plagued with it. Saul was like, I, I, they're announcing me. Uh, am I, do I have the right outfit on? Um, do you think they're going to like me? Do you, you, ever, you ever notice how insecurity goes like this? Do you? Do you think then I've ran? Because 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 it's it's a physical posture of a mental mentality. I'm not enough. If I were you today, I'd say I'm not perfect. This is my this is my orange theory kicking in right now. But I know that God called me. I know that God chose me. I know that God's for me. And I know that God's with me. <laughs> Come on. So the first thing that starts to get Saul is he's, he's number one, he's insecure. And, and, then, and then even to, to go further, right down number two, he's impatient. He's got no patience. He can't wait on God. I want to remind somebody today, God is never too early and he's never too late. He's an on-time God. Come on, do you believe that about God? And sometimes you got to wait on, come on, everybody clap together. Anybody believe God's on time? And so there's... There's this situation. Again, God's going to put you into situations. And so Saul's in the situation where his, his boss, Samuel, Samuel, the one that chose him and anointed him, Samuel says, wait here. Don't make the sacrifice until I get back. Don't, I know you're going to want to, and I know you're going to be tempted to, but don't make the sacrifice until I get back. And so here he's waiting, and Samuel's not returned. And so he starts to fret, and he starts to panic. I'm okay that you panic. I just am concerned with what you do with your panic. I'm okay that you get worried, but the Bible says be worried about nothing and everything through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. That's why 21 days of prayer and fasting matters because I'm putting my confidence back in God. I'm taking it out of my hands and I'm putting my life back in God's hands. Come on, everybody clap together and thank God. I know you deal with impatience, so do I. And so watch this. this. You can't make this up. Chapter 13, verse 7. Meanwhile, Saul stayed at Gilgal, and his men were trembling with fear. And Saul waited there seven days for Samuel, as Samuel had instructed him earlier. But Samuel didn't come. And Saul realized that his troops were rapidly slipping away. So he demanded, bring me the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And Saul sacrificed the burnt offering himself. Just as Saul was finishing with the burnt offering, Samuel arrived. Saul went out to milk him and Samuel said, what is this you have done? Saul replied, oh, I saw my men uh, scattering from me, and uh, didn't, you didn't arrive. And, and, and the Philistines, they're, they're at Michmash, they were ready for battle. So I said, the Philistines are ready to march against us at Gilgal, and I haven't even asked for the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering myself before you came. How foolish, Samuel exclaimed. You have not kept the command that the Lord your God gave you. Had you kept it, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom must end. 
For the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. The Lord has already appointed him to be the leader of his people because you have not kept the, the Lord's command. Have you ever been in a place where you're like, I, 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 got, I got to get married right now. Some, some dude in the back was like. You know, when God chose Saul, he knew that he was impatient. He knew he had that weakness. But he was hoping and he had confidence that he would turn and wait on God's perfect timing instead of taking matters into his own hand. And, and, and Samuel shows up. And have you ever gotten caught doing something stupid and you're trying to cover for your mistake? And Saul walks out and he's like, hey, Sam. How you? Hey, you're back. Hey, man. Hey. And Sammy goes, what have you been doing? Ah, uh, 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 what? Yeah, uh, yeah. I, this is crazy. Man. Everybody's turned it against me, so I had to. Isn't it crazy how you can justify taking matters back into your own hands rather than waiting on God's perfect timing? Stop taking your life back. Keep surrendered to God's perfect plan and perfect timing. So he's insecure, he's impatient. Look at number three, he's disobedient. He disobeys God. In fact, I won't read it just for sake of time, but this, is, this one's crazy. This one time, God speaks to Saul, the leader of Israel, and says, Saul, we're gonna go take out the Amalekites, wipe them out utterly, destroy them completely, every last one of them. So when they go out to battle, Saul lets the king of the Amalekites, King Agag, live. And when they go through the spoil, he's like, ah, this is salvageable. Ah, this could work for us. This would look good in my house. And he keeps some of the spoil. And so God shows up and says, Saul, what are you doing? I gave you specific instructions to do this. Why don't you obey? Some of us need to understand, God is not looking for your sacrifice. God is looking for your obedience. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And if you really want to love God, obey him. If you really want to walk with God, obey God. You do not please God by coming to a service. You do not please God by singing a song. You do not please God by changing your bio to Christian. You do not please God by how you vote. You please God by obeying the voice of the Lord. You please God by saying, Lord, no matter what you say, no matter what it costs me, no matter what I have to do, no matter what I think compared to what you think, come on, clap together if you're thankful. I'm going to obey God no matter what it costs. I mean, we're getting ready to celebrate it, but I'll never forget when we moved from L.A., to, uh, from Seattle to L.A., we only had two kids. Those were the days. Oh, man. I always tell Julia, we had two too many. We would have been great with two kids. And we moved down with our two kids. But do you think Julia and I were sitting in Seattle going like, you know what would be fun? Let's go to like the hardest city in America and let's start a church. What do you think? We've got no money. Let's go. We don't have any offices. Let's go. No, we, we came to L.A. because God said, you are going to move to Los Angeles and start a church. It will be called Zoe Church, and you will make an impact and partner with the other local churches in Los Angeles to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we are only here, not because of our idea, but because of our obedience to the Father above. I just want to tell somebody today, go back, go back. Go back and do the last thing God told you to do. What was the last thing he told you to do? Go back and do it. Let me ask you, what was the last thing God told you to do? Go back and do it. Because don't go into 21 prayer, days of prayer and fasting and be like, God, I'm just looking for that new vision. And God's like, so cool, that's great. Hey, could you go back and like, um, you mind? Is that cool? No, like, I'd love to take you to yogurt land, but before we go, could you, like, go do that one thing that I asked you to? Remember how I asked you to forgive them? Remember, remember how I asked you to serve? Remember, remember when I was talking to you about this issue in your life? Go, go back. I just want to encourage somebody today. Go back and do the last thing God told you to do. And don't get, don't, don't, don't get it twisted. God's not into sacrifice as much as he's into obedience. 
And then when you obey God, then double up on it and bring a sacrifice. So Saul, in, 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 and I, I don't mean to discourage you today because I, I got some of this stuff in my life and I'm under progress just like you. He's, he's, he's impatient and he's insecure and he's disobedient. Here's the last one, number four. He's, he, write, write down number four. He's jealous. He deals with covetousness or another Bible term, envy. He wants what they have. It's like my kids watching, watch, watching a cyber truck drive by. <laughs> Dick, can we get one of those? I'm sorry, you don't like our minivan? What? Weird. It's called a swagger wagon, son. Get with the times. And Saul is actually plagued with jealousy of a man named David who's going to take his place. I didn't say this last service, but I, I want to say it here. One of the warnings of this story is that if you won't obey God and do what he's asked you to do, he'll take away what he's given you and he'll give it to a better person. And David is that better man. And that's what God tells Saul over and over. I've chosen somebody else who will obey me. And so he, he gets jealous. In fact, um, David goes out for war, and when they come back from Paris, everybody is just going crazy. And they, they have this chant. Saul has slain his thousands, cool, but David is ten thousands. And the people love David, and they tolerate Saul. And Saul's ego can't handle this. Saul's insecurity just goes crazy. Saul's, he just... He can't handle another man being praised but, but his own. You know that saying, no head higher than mine? Saul's that guy. And he's so jealous. Watch what it says. This is, you can't make this up. This is, this is 1 Samuel 18, 8. Saul was very angry. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. You know you're in trouble when you're keeping a close eye on people and not a close eye on Jesus. When you're more interested in stalking and watching their life and you stop stalking and tracking God's life. From that day forward, Saul developed a jealous eye and he started watching David. Was David, was David wearing? Where's David going? Who's David sitting with? Was David watching? Was David, who's David? And he watched him with a jealous eye. I want to just encourage you today. Stop looking at what people have. Start being thankful for what God's given you. Start living with an eye of gratitude and thank. Come on, let's get vertical and say, thank you, God. I'm from a nowhere tribe. I'm from a nowhere people. And yet you chose me and loved me and blessed blessed me and healed me and Saul couldn't do this and so watch how it goes even further watch this not trusting God leads to he started dealing with anger he had increased paranoia and he had mental instability the, I mean just it goes from it watch this it's just impatient insecure disobedient jealous anger paranoia mental instability all of this could have been solved in a relationship with God what is the antidote to having these issues God what is the solution? Worship team, come join me. What is the solution to your sadness? What is the thing that's going to get you out of impatience and disobedience and jealousy and anger and paranoia? Trusting God, worshiping God, serving God, following God, loving God, relationship with God. You ever notice, you ever notice that when you get back with God, you're like, oh, yep, there it is. My bad. I went crazy. But now that I'm back with you, ho, oh, thank you, Jesus. This is what I need, and this is what I want, and this is who I really am. And Lord, I just want to say, will you forgive me for being so impatient? Will you forgive me for being so weird and insecure? Will you forgive me for disobeying you, for being jealous of what another person has? Forgive my anger issue and my paranoia about the future and forgive my mental instability. Thank you, God, that you would wash me and heal me and cleanse me and restore me by your good hand. That's all Saul needed was relationship with God. But these compound fractures get further and further into the problem and the issue. 
I don't think God had a problem choosing and he chose the wrong number one draft pick. I don't think that was God's problem. God is not like the Portland Trailblazers who can't figure out how to make a number one pick to save their life. They chose Sam Bowie over Michael Jordan. Get out of here. Dumbest thing I've ever heard. Oh, the next time they get a number one pick, you can't make it up. They choose Greg Oden over Kevin Durant. Get out of here. I don't think God's in heaven going like, man, we missed. We can't believe it. We chose Saul. Who would have thought he's the Sam Bowie of Israel? No disrespect to Sam Bowie if you're watching on the stream. You think God didn't know that Saul had issues? You think Saul got down the road and God's like, wait, he's not perfect? What? Come on, man. We thought you were going to be better than this. No, it's called potential. It's called free will. And you could choose Jesus today, or you could choose pleasure. You could choose God, or you could choose yourself. But you've got to make a choice. And I don't know about you, but today, I've got too much writing on the line for me to avoid the problems in my life. I don't want it to inflict pain on my loved ones. I don't want it to affect you. I don't want it to affect Julia and my children. I got to deal with my stuff. How about you? I'm under construction. Are you? And Saul would have been fine had he just admitted, God, I, I really struggle with patience. God, I just, I got to admit, I'm, I'm really insecure. I know you chose me, but I don't even like my body. I don't even like where I'm from, my town. I don't. Thank you for choosing me, but I don't even get it. Like if you would have been honest. Some of us, our biggest problem is you're not even honest with you, so you don't even know how to be honest with others. Honesty is an inward work. You be honest with God. God, I'm mad. I'm disappointed. I'm frustrated. I'm know what a good cry would have done for Saul? You ever cry so hard at the end, you're just like. <gasps> Saul needed an altar before God. Saul needed to stop playing games like everything was good when it's not good. Who told you that the more you manage your image, you're going to be all right? You're not going to be all right. And the pain that you're going to inflict on the loved ones in your life is going to be greater collateral damage than you ever signed up for. But if you'll repent and you'll get right with Jesus, Jesus that we serve could heal you, love you, wash you, cleanse you, and free you. Oh, come on, give him a greater praise if you believe that's the power that my God has. Come on, give him a greater praise if you believe that God sees the struggle of your life and still calls your name. He didn't call you because you're qualified. You're qualified because you're called. He didn't see a perfect person. There are no perfect people. There's only been one perfect man and his name is Jesus. And he's the Jesus I'm preaching today. He's the Jesus we serve. He's the author and the perfecter of our faith. And we might be a work in progress, but I'm going to keep on serving and keep on worshiping and keep on loving and keep on allowing him to have space in my life. I love this scripture. Read what the Bible says. If that's the problem, let's look at the solution. James chapter 5, verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. You need to get healed. You need to get healed from that disobedient season. You need to get healed from that impatience. You need to get healed from that rebellion. You need to get healing, but you're not going to get healed until you confess. So I 21 days of prayer and fasting. I want you to write down in your journal, write down in your notes. What am I believing God for? What miracle do I need? What do I need God to heal me from? If you confess your sins one to another, God will heal you. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Last scripture, stand to your feet. Stand, everybody stand up. Westside, stand with us. Read this verse, Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Now it's time to change your ways. Come on, church. It's time to change our ways. Turn to face God so he can wipe away your sins. 
pour out showers of blessing to refresh you and send you the Messiah he prepared for you, namely Jesus. Come on, it's time to change our ways. If we don't change our ways, we're going to fall down that slippery path that Saul slipped down. And I don't know about you, but I want to deal with the pain of my life so I can turn my test into my testimony. Turn my pain into a platform. Turn what I went through in my past to tell somebody, if God brought me through it, He can bring you through it. If God gave me victory in this area, He could give you victory in this area. If God did it for me, He could do it for you. Amen.